So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Well, so glad that you're with us today as we continue this series. If this was uh, done, this series on Ruth was done like a good television show, this is the part where I'd be uh, recapping last week for you, what happened. Because I left you at the end of last week with a little bit of a cliffhanger, a look ahead. And that was the verse that you just heard. But for those of you that might be new, weren't with us, here's what's going on. We are looking at a story in the book of Ruth about a young lady who was from the other side of the tracks. The other side of town, actually from a completely different country like the enemy land. Her name was Ruth. And she was the daughter-in-law to a woman named Naomi. And Naomi had lost her husband, her sons, and all she had left was these daughters-in-law. There's a famine that's happening in the land. She decides to return home to Bethlehem, to Israel, and to try to figure out how to survive. And she tells the girls, you should just go back to your moms and dads. Like, there's just really no hope. I'm not sure this is going to turn out. One of them does. That The other, named Ruth, decides to show what we talked about last week was loyal love. Covenant, faithful, hesed is the Hebrew word, loyal love for Naomi. And so uh, we left it with they start their journey back towards Bethlehem, which is also known as the house of bread. And we left it with that verse that says, just as the barley harvest was beginning. Today's message is entitled Providential Provision. And I want to tell you a little bit about what I hope to do over the next few minutes. I want to show you in this really ancient story uh, some ways that you can trust God at work in your life. God is constantly on the move at work in a way that we call providence. Uh, providence is uh, this word that a lot of us kind of intuit what it means, but let me give you a quick definition so we're all on the same page. Providence is the continuing action of God by which he sustains his creation and also guides it to his intended purpose for it. Uh, there's a lot in the uh, worldview of people that would think of God's interaction with the world as this, that he kind of gets it all going, winds it up, and then just lets it go. That's called deism, and it's the way many of us actually operate, that God is kind of a, a starter, but then he goes on and he's got other things to do, and so he just lets whatever happens happen. Uh, but actually, what we're going to see in this story what I'm going to challenge you to see during this time period of Lent and what I hope God brings to your memory often is that he is actively at work all over your life. So Naomi and Ruth, they're heading back to Bethlehem just as the barley harvest was starting. I'm going to show you how God provides in the story in three different ways. God always provides for us supernaturally, God provides for us situationally, and God also provides structurally. And here's what I mean by that. Supernaturally first, this is not the most common way that God provides, but sometimes he does things with miracles, right? Some, some of us know the stories throughout the scripture of where God has showed up on the scene and just done something really, really incredible, like manna. This miracle food that came from heaven when the children of Israel were starving, right? Or sometimes he sends a raven with lunch for a prophet like Elijah. Uh, he, Jesus turned water into wine when a party for a wedding was looking pretty rough at the last moment. It was a supernatural thing. Sometimes he would heal people in a really powerful, invisible way. And every time God provides supernaturally, it often causes people to take notice and for their faith to grow. But sometimes he does that miraculous thing and nobody knows about it except you. And when that takes place in your life, you should write it down. You should remember that. And any time you need the faith reminder that God's at work, you got to pull that story back out. And you should tell it to your kids and grandkids as well. That's a really important part. But supernatural is not the normal way that God works in our life. Most often, it's a little more 
incognito behind the scenes. John Piper, uh, pastor, says that God is always up to 10,000 things in our lives, and sometimes we're aware of three or four. Isn't that right? We can see his hand, but not always as clearly as we should. So Ruth and Naomi come back. I'm going to walk you through this story. I'm going to make a couple of points. And my hope at the end of this is that you would choose to trust God today in a way with your life that you've never done before. So here we go. Ruth chapter 2, verse 2. It says, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Ruth and Naomi have made it back to Bethlehem. they got to find a way to survive. The way that they choose is to go out into these fields that surrounded the city of Bethlehem and to pick up leftover grain. So she's going to go to work, making sure she can take care of her and her mother-in-law. And Naomi says, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. Do you guys know what gleaning is? Uh, gleaning is a term that still happens today. In fact, last night at the Saturday night service, there was a lady, she was about 87, she was from Germany, and she told me that as a child, she gleaned in the fields outside of Munich. J- just incredible how this still happens in our world. But gleaning is where poor people would go and pick up just kind of scraps, and that's how they would survive. It says, as it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz who was from the clan of Elimelech. Elimelech is Naomi's dead husband. And the writer wants us to understand when he writes these words that as it turned out, Ruth happened into the field that belonged to a relative of her mother-in-law. Now, if you read this in Hebrew, it would be so obvious that what the writer is trying to say is like, as it turned out, this is a wink and a nod, like, it's not just happenstance. God is making this happen. He is guiding her into this particular field because he's got a big purpose and plan for her. So she goes and gleans. And then Boaz, the guy who owns the field, he comes out and, and he looks around and he decides to check on everything and he sees this person that stands out. He grabs one of his managers and he says, hey, who's that girl? Now, Some people think that the reason that he pointed her out is because she was really, really beautiful. And like if you have a super romantic kind of bone in your body, I I get it. You might think that too. And and it's going to get there eventually. But I don't think that's why she stands out. Because she is picking up grain. She's hard. Have any of you ever picked stuff in an agricultural setting out of a field? This is not glamorous work. She's not looking her best. She's got a messy bun and sweat all down her face. She's dirty. This is not uh, Ruth ready for the pageant. This is Ruth just a mess. The reason that she stands out is not necessarily because she's so beautiful. It's because she's different. Because remember, she's part of the Moabite clan. She is ethnically different. She probably has a different skin color. And Boaz, though he doesn't know all the people who work for him or all the people who would be gleaning there, he sees this person who's completely different. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Here in Israel proper, where the people were God's people, and he's provided in a time of famine this harvest, a barley harvest that's really, really good. It's it's the first harvest of the year. It's the first fruits. And something incredible is happening there in Bethlehem, but there's this one total outsider. She is a barren, refugee, widow who looks different than everybody else. And Boaz takes notice, and God took notice. She stands out, and her story has begun to be told all across the city, all around the town. This is where I think God shows up situationally. It didn't just happen that Ruth showed up at the time of the barley harvest. It didn't just happen that she shows up in this field. It didn't just happen that Boaz was a relative of Naomi. God is moving things to work on her behalf because he's going to do something incredible for her. 
I, I was thinking about how this has happened in my life too. At one time when Jessica and I were pretty newly married, we had uh, one child, Savannah. She was just a couple months old. And I, at the time, I was building a business, working on trying to, to grow this thing, and it was really rough. And there were a lot of months that we would get to the end of the month and look at the bills and be like, I don't know. I'm not sh- I'm, I don't know how this is going to work. Now, Jessica is really, really faithful, has a ton of faith. Like, I'm the professional Christian, but she actually is the one with all the faith. And so we're sitting around. I can still remember what our living room looked like. We're sitting there on the couch, and we're looking at all the bills, and they're gathered up, and, and we're thinking, how's this going to work? And she's like, you know what? We're just going to pray for our bills. I'm like, put our hands on the bills. And there's a part of me that's thinking, if I'm really honest, like, I don't know that's how that works. I'm not sure Wells Fargo is going to care about this moment, right? But we pray. And we finish, and I go off the next day to work and come home and walk in the door, and she's like visibly moved. She's kind of like, you know, maybe in tears, but not the sad tears, like the happy ones. I'm like, what is going on? She's like, you're never going to believe this. We got in the mail today a refund check from the hospital, they overcharged us for Savannah's delivery, and they sent us a check. And I'm like, awesome, how much is the check for? And she's like, exactly the amount of money that we need to make the bills. Right? That's crazy. Here's the real miracle. This is the supernatural part in that. What kind of hospital sends you a refund without you asking for it? That doesn't happen. And that's the super, but here's the, the situational, like we really had overpaid. So it's not like God dropped money out of the sky. He just caused the situations to all happen at the same moment that we got what we needed when we needed it. And it grew our faith. And, and I hope maybe today it'll grow yours a little bit too. But you probably have a story like that as well if your eyes are open and your, your heart is open to see it. This is what's happening in Ruth's story Right there, God's always doing 10,000 things, but we don't always notice them. So Boaz says, who's the girl? And his manager comes over, and, and the manager says, well, we'll put it on the screen. He says, she's the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. And she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. So she came to the field, and she's been here from morning until now, except a little short rest in the shelter. I want you to notice how hard Ruth is working. She is in need, God's going to provide, but he meets her energy. He meets her willingness to work for this. She, she's not just sitting back going, uh, take care of me. She's, she's engaged. This isn't a handout from God, but this is an incredible moment where he takes her faithfulness and he meets it with his own. So Boaz says to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go glean in another field. Don't go away from here. You stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I've told them not to lay a hand on you. That was necessary because this was a really dangerous position to be in. He says, I've told them don't lay a hand on you. And if you're ever thirsty, go get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. Now that right there, that's not supposed to happen either. Like she shouldn't have drank from this water. Remember, she's other. But he's including her in. This is Boaz going above and beyond what's expected or even necessary. This is generosity. That's all the generosity is, right? It is to do more, especially we think of it with time or money, to do more than what's expected. And he just goes overboard for her. We talked about hesed last week. He kind of shows her hesed kindness. And she's blown away by it. So Ruth says to Boaz, why are you doing this for me? And verse 11, he replies, well, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother in your homeland and came to live with a people you didn't know before. He says, basically, your faithfulness, your love of Naomi has got my attention. In fact, the whole town's talking about it. And then he prays this prayer. He says, may the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you've come to take refuge. The story is spreading, and it really shouldn't. 
There's no way in the world that thousands of years later we should still be talking about one barren refugee widow from the enemy territory. Only because God wants us to see what's in this story. Only because he wants to speak to you and to me about how he's providing, not just for her, not just for them, but for us. And he does it supernaturally, and he does it situationally, and sometimes he goes even further than that. See, Boaz was following the law that God had put in place for the people of Israel. Um, In that time, God had made sure that when his people, and and this is before like King David and all that, this is early on in their history, but he had given them the law. And in that law, he had told them a few things. I want to make sure that we take care of those who are poor and in need. Boaz prays a prayer for God to provide. But his intention, I want you to see this, his intention is that he's going to be the answer to that prayer. He himself is actually going to be a generous person following after his God and take care of Naomi. So, or take care of Ruth. So Ruth gathers up 30 pounds worth of barley, we're told. That's, that's a lot. It's about a month's worth of food, and she carries it home to Naomi. She gets home after a long day with Boaz. She walks in the door, and her mother-in-law asks her in verse 19, So where did you glean today? Where'd you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. And then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. Fade to black, commercial break. (laughs) God is also providing structurally in this story. In Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 24, verse 19, God has set up the way that his people are going to handle gleanings, that going to pick up what's left over. And here's what he said. When you're harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, don't go back to get it. Okay, so you imagine you are an agricultural person. You've got a field, and what's going to feed your family is how well the crops come up. Uh, It's how much you can sell out of what you can harvest. It's really important for you to get everything out of this field that you can because it's literally life and death. And God says, but when you're going about getting the harvest, if you happen to miss some, don't go back and pick it up. You leave that, he says, for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, the most vulnerable people in society. Leave it for them so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. And then listen to this in Leviticus 19.9. When you reap the harvest of your land, don't reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do you see what God's saying? Okay, here's, here's, your, here's your square. He says, you can gather the stuff up. If you miss some, you got to leave it. Uh, but also, I don't want you to fully maximize the harvest. You, you don't go all the way out to the perimeter. God actually is not allowing the people to maximize their profit because he wants them to learn that he's the provider. So he says, you don't take everything out of this land. I'll take care of that. In fact, what he says is, you leave some for those who are vulnerable. The way that I would put it is, God says, you take care of my business and I'll take care of yours. I I want you to be a part of the solution. I want you to be a part of the answered prayer for these people who need it. Isn't that cool? That's built into the structure of the law. And it's all about this idea of generosity, which really has a paradox, the way that God views it. In Proverbs eleven twenty four, we read that one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another one withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. What, what he's saying is, it doesn't make sense that sometimes the person who lives totally open-handed, we watch them, they, they just give, and they're open, they're generous, and they just seem to continue to prosper. And that doesn't make sense. Because then the other person sometimes, who's like uh, really, really frugal and, and maybe like a miser, which actually is in the word miserable, you can connect that yourself later, but the person who's like super, super focused on I got to hold this and keep it, they end up coming to poverty. That's not the way it should work. Now, Proverbs is a book of principles, not promises. So it's, it's, it's the principle at work here. It doesn't always happen. We've all thought of examples or been an example where that doesn't go this way. But in general, God has built this paradox of generosity into the universe. That if you give and live open-handedly like he does, you'll see more. 
This is how he provides, even through the structure. I, I talk about uh, things in terms of real simple like definitions. It's, that's because I need it. But here's a definition for you of generosity. When it comes to, to money, when it comes to resource, when it comes to your words or your time, when it comes to your life, this is what generosity is. It's trust plus obedience. Trust that the God who inspired these words and created these laws, that the God of abundance, when we trust him and obey to be people like him, to be generous and to give, when we do that, that he will show up, that he'll be faithful, that he provides. And sometimes we need more of one of those things than the other. Some days when things are going all up and to the right, trust is easy, it all looks good, and so then we give, right? But there are other moments when things don't look so good and we have to just obey even if we don't see it. Because this is what most of us do. We look at what we have and we believe that how much we have determines how generous we can be. Right? I look at my stuff. Here's how much I got. I can be this generous. But what God says is how much faith you have determines how generous you can be. How much you trust me determines how open-handedly you can live. And that's a whole different way of life. It's an incredible adventure and invitation into a way of abundance that God promises and built into the world. With this definition, we can be generous uh, with everything. God says, let your faith determine how generous you can be. And that's the goal for us. It's becoming generous people. So in the structure, he builds this gleaning stuff. He says, don't maximize profits. And then he does something else. He builds in what was called the tithe. And the tithe at this time was to take the first 10%, one, one-tenth of your first fruits, in like this super faith move. Because you don't know what's going to happen next, but you take the first 10% and you give it back to God. And that money would go to support the priests, and it would go into stores to be able to care for those who were sick or who, who were uh, poor or who had found calamity had come upon them. And this generous faith move to give off the top is what God would use to answer the prayers of other people. It's a really, really incredible thing. Now, it still works that way, and at the risk of being condescending, because some of you know this, but I get that some people, especially if you're new to church, you don't. Like, the same way that God had the tabernacle be funded or the temple be funded is how the church is funded now. So, as you give, that's what pays salaries and light bills and property and, and also does all the ministry that we do here and around the world. That's where that comes from, is from giving. So when God invites us to be people who off the top return a faith move portion of 10% to him, it's an incredible thing to see how he takes it and multiplies it and uses it. There's still to this day a part of our church that makes sure that we care for those who are in need. And we're going to take up next week a, a special offering for our deacon fund. Uh, that's a, a way that we actually care for the physical needs of people in the church. And so we have some that's budgeted, but we also every year kind of supercharge that by taking an additional offering. And so I want you to be thinking about that for next week as to how you might give to it. Uh, but in order to kind of help you get a picture for what it does, I wanted you to check out this video. So take a look at this, and then I'll be right back. So we met in 2002 in junior high, actually at St. Andrews. This place was something that shaped our relationship and also shaped who we would become as people because of all those wonderful people that we were surrounded with and how honored we were to be able to not only go here but then come back and work and be able to maybe shape some some lives of the children that uh, were in the youth program. And we just, we lived down the street so we stayed active in the community and... Yeah, it was like the best little house, like this little granny unit behind this bigger house and we were, we could walk down the street to church or to the Conwisher's house. It was, it was a really fun time in life and it was, you know, everything you picture uh, a young uh, married couple life to be. And then in March 2019, we had our first kid. Um, 
We call her Maggie, but her full name is Margaret June. And then uh, 2022, we had our son, Wes. Um, and then two months after Wes was born is when our whole lives changed. I was just having some depth perception issues, some headaches, which was really unusual for me. And yeah, and it was uh, three days three from days. everything was normal in our lives and just some weird headaches mm -hmm. to having emergency brain surgery. And I remember calling uh, Andrew Kroger um, and Casey Kroger, and because I know they're prayer warriors, and I said, can you just please pray? Because we're terrified, we're scared, and we know that they would connect us to everyone at St. Andrews, and they did, and, um, and we started our prayer chains for Dan. And um, so surgery was supposed to take four hours, and I got a call 45 minutes in, and the surgeon said, I need to talk to you, and that's all he said. And my heart stopped, and I thought that I had lost him. Um, and then he came walking through uh, the doors, and he said, surgery's great, everything went well, and uh, Dan's asking for you. Uh, but that was just the beginning. Um, and we heard from pathology. It was uh, something called a glioblastoma, which is a brain cancer uh, in its most aggressive form, basically. Yeah, they said there's no cure for it, um, and they gave us a prognosis that's hard to hear. And on this particularly hard day after we had gotten the news from pathology, I was um, in the closet <laughs> crying because I don't want the kids to see. I get a phone call. It is one of the deacons from St. Andrews, and um, I didn't know who he was, but he, uh, he knows who he is. And he said, what can I do for you? I've heard your story. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for your husband and for healing and for your family. And I just, I sat in that closet with him on the other end of the phone and I just cried. And it was the most beautiful phone call that I could have gotten at the perfect time. And uh, we just want to thank the Deacon Ministry for what they have done for us. They not only helped us for praying and praying over our family, but they've been helping us financially with Dan's um, extra uh, therapies. Not everything is covered through medical insurance. And Dan is going through chemo now. He's done, he did his radiation six weeks over at Hogue. Now he's doing uh, 12 rounds of chemo next year. Uh, and he's done three so far and he's a trooper. He's getting through it. The overwhelming kindness has just been, uh, you know, uh, we you always know the church is around you and you go, yeah, okay, everybody's here and everybody says hi on Sunday when they come in, but then to see it in action is something completely different and we are just so grateful to be in such an awesome community that God has placed us in. Guys, St. Andrews, that's you. That's what happens when you choose to live the way that God intended, is that you can never, ever, ever predict how God will use your choice to be generous. On the other side, you can't. I mean, I, I listen to that story and I think about how early on, uh, Daniel and Brittany, they gave, they were generous by, by investing their time and, and working with teenagers. That's like the most generous thing that you can do. And they did that. And then look how God is caring and providing. And I believe that he's going to continue to provide for them and he can do the same for you. And I just want to ask you today, look, we can talk about, some people will come up to me after, I'm sure, and say the tithe and, and, the, Old, and the New Testament, that's an Old Testament thing. Like, we can talk about that. Jesus said he agreed with it, but that's whatever. We'll talk more about it later. Here's what I want for you. I don't care about the number. I, I don't care about some rule for you, what I want is what God wants, is that we would all become more generous. And, and for some of you, the tithe is a long way off. And that's okay. What, what I want to ask all of us to do today is to just take, like, wherever you're starting from, just take one step. Could you just take one more step towards the picture that God paints of his abundance and his generosity to us?
Maybe, maybe 10% is way too much for you. And in fact, right now, you're just barely able to make it. And maybe what you do is you choose to live a life that's so open with your time and your experience and your words. And you become a generous person in that way for now. And you trust the faithfulness of God. For some of you, 10% doesn't change your standard of living a bit. You could triple tithe and it wouldn't affect you at all. And you should. And you should engage in that way. Wherever we're starting from, it's all about just moving toward God. You can do this if you're a teenager, and I'm not even just talking about your dollars. What would it look like for you in your high school when everybody expects you to be cynical and angry? What if you chose to be generous with words and you spoke life into people and encouraged people? There are all kinds of ways for us to live how God calls us to. And today I just want to ask you, would you join with me in in saying we're committed to take a step towards the heart of God? Here's why we can do it. It's a great story, and and it's really inspiring. But hidden in this story is pointing to Jesus, who is the ultimate act of provision for us. Because we'll explore this more next week. But just like Boaz was a righteous one who lived up to the law and went above and beyond, so did Jesus. It was supernatural. God became a man and came to earth in a moment. That is a miracle. It was also situational. He entered into our world at a particular place and time, and he enters our life right at the moment when we trust him, and he meets our needs not just for now but for eternity. And he says, you can live totally open-handed because I've got you. The worst thing that can happen to you is death. And once that happens, you're with me forever in eternal joy and purpose. Come on. And then it's structural too because Jesus fulfilled all the requirements of the law. Did everything that was demanded. Lived it perfectly well. Died an unjust death on the cross. And then got up out of the grave. Folks, you can and I, we can live like this all day long because we have eternity to enjoy the blessings and the benefits that God gives us because of Christ. So this is what I'm putting before you. Make a step today. Choose whatever it looks like for you to move towards generosity. Can we do that together? Yeah? Okay. I see some nods. I see some people wrestling. I get it. For Jessica and I, it was really hard for a long time to get to that place. We ended up having to just like automate our giving so that it came out first and we didn't even think about it. You can do that here too. No problem. But for, I would say for us and for countless other people that I know, the principle is true. You cannot outgive God. If you take him at his word and you trust him, just like he provided for some barren, refugee, widow, thousands of years ago, he will provide for you.